This is sort of the third message in a row that has to do with what started in my mind several weeks ago, well, months ago, actually, <laughs> in getting ready for our Wednesday evening uh, midweek grace subject, uh, looking at the book of Proverbs. And uh, so um, there's still something yet on my mind uh, with respect to the wisdom of, of our Lord teaching us how to live for Him. And then now for today, specifically, uh, fighting pessimism in a post-Christian society. Uh, so I want to speak to you just for a few moments on picking up where we actually left off last week in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And I want to address something that uh, I'm feeling in my own heart uh, with respect to what's going on in our culture and society around us. And... Um, and uh, so, may the Lord bless our time. I'm going to read the text and then give thanks. Matthew chapter 5, uh, we were actually in the first part of that quite a bit last week. Chapter 5, just pick it up at verse 10, and we'll read all the way through verse 16. Matthew 5, verse 10 says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. <clears throat> Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people put a lamp, light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So let's uh, pause and ask the Lord to strengthen. Uh, Lord, thank you for this passage. It speaks like a wise king. These short statements, these word pictures of salt and light and a city on a hill and uh, the, the call to, be, to, un, to know ourselves as blessed. We have been blessed when we are reviled. That's a strange, strange thing to say, Lord, to our hearts. But we need that, and we need to hear it. We need to understand what it means. We need to understand how to respond. And what does it mean to be salt and light when being reviled for living, living for Christ is escalating in this country? And in our hearts, Lord, I know in my heart we feel pessimistic about living and reaching the lost world around us. Lord, would you help us now in the next few moments in our hearts to fight against pessimism uh, towards uh, the culture and the society that we're living our lives in? Would you help us to see with your eyes this morning what we need to see? And may, by your Spirit, may we hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. In your name we pray. Amen. I enjoy reading Al Mohler. As you know, he is one of my heroes of the faith and uh, the president of Southern Seminary, uh, the flagship seminary of the Southern Baptist Convention located in Louisville, Kentucky. This past week, this is a short portion of what he posted on his blog. Quote, Planned Parenthood stands at the epicenter of the culture of death and receives almost half a billion dollars a year in government support. They are not going to be able to explain this video away. When the Allied forces liberated the concentration camps of the Nazi regime, General Dwight D. Eisenhower ordered 
the ordinary German citizens of nearby towns and villages to walk through the camps and to see what they had allowed and facilitated. Eisenhower's point was all too clear. You allowed this to happen and you share the guilt. So it is with all Americans, as Al Mohler continues to write, Planned Parenthood and the abortion industrial complex are funded with our tax dollars. Let me drop a point in here. Someone else wrote on this and actually figured it up, did the math. $500 million a year. How much is that per hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year? How much is that per hour? Guess how much? $60,000 per hour of tax dollars. Every hour. In 15 minutes, since we started at 10 o'clock, 60 grand of tax dollars. Next hour, 60,000 more. 60,000 more. Every single hour. That brings to terms how much half a, half a billion dollars is. 60 grand an hour all year long. Back to Al Mohler. Funded with our tax dollars, period. Planned Parenthood's founder, Margaret Sanger, was a racist openly committed to eugenics. Millions of unborn babies have died in its facilities. The group thrives because Americans allow it to thrive. When this video went viral yesterday, I waited to see how the mainstream media and abortion supporters would respond. That response has, for the most part, been exactly what I expected. Defend Planned Parenthood at any cost. But the video is out there, and it will stay out there. There is no way to unsee it once it is seen. We must pray that this video will mark an important turning point in our nation's conscience. Images and words can become seared in our minds. The horrifying knowledge of harvested baby hearts must lead to our own broken hearts. A nation that will allow this will allow anything. And his essay ended. That's true. That alone, besides all the other things that are taking place, has a tendency to make me pessimistic about the culture that I'm living in. I don't think I'm the only one. So, what do I do? <laughs> well... I'm going to go down with a book, okay? Let's go down with a book. No matter what, I want, I want to know what Jesus has to say to me. You should know, want to know that too. I think you do. That's why you're here. I, I need help. I'm growing. I'm having a tendency of being very upset and so sick and tired of what I'm seeing. And I don't think it's going to get any better. So, Lord, help us. I want to give you three things this morning um, to help pave the way. Keeping in mind that the title alone, when I say fighting pessimism, uh, fighting this angst and this discouragement, this despair, uh, even maybe even hostility in my own heart to the point where I, 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 I'm, I'm struggling to love my neighbor. I'm struggling to uh, love people. Uh, I'm struggling to pray the way I need to pray. So that's the issue of pessimism. So fighting pessimism in a post-Christian society. I do not mean when I use that term, just like David Wells and other good writers, good theologians and pastors, um, cultural watchdogs in uh, good theological circles. When I use the term post-Christian, I don't mean to say that this country was, a, was Christian. Because I don't believe it, not according to history. This country never did embrace Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. It did use God language a lot, but it never, as a whole and in general, embraced Jesus Christ as its Lord and Savior. So when I say post-Christian, that's what I don't mean. But here's what I do mean. 
We are living in a post-Christian society, in a post-Christian culture, to the degree that the influence of Christianity is almost gone. It's like the restraining effect of Christianity, biblical Christianity, lovers of Christ, the restraining effect of that is waning. And I do agree with many pastors and theologians that we are living in now a post-Christian influenced society. Um, And Christians, biblical Christians, and biblical Christianity is clearly in the minority and is growing more and more so in the minority in this country. So, here are three biblical perspectives that make that kind of pessimism <laughs> that we're feeling, that I, if you're feeling it, uh, I'm feeling it, and I'm thinking about you, so what can we do? I'm gonna, I want to fight against it. I, want, I, want it. I don't want it to overtake my life. So, number one, I'm going to follow Jesus. Watch what Jesus does. Number one, focus on individuals, not culture. It's really easy to watch the news, listen to the news, look at the magazine rack stands at Jewel or wherever you go, go Twitter, watch what's happening in the, in the, in the digital world and, and grow pessimistic toward what's going on. Focus on individuals, however, not culture. Watch Jesus himself do this. All right, chapter 7, very last verse. Verse two verses where we left off last week. His sermon is finished and Matthew comments saying, and when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching for he was teaching them as one who had authority. He's superior to Solomon, the only person that he mentions in the entire sermon and not as their scribes. Chapter eight, verse one. And when he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. But behold... A leper. And you have an outline, a sermon outline in your worship folder. Watch what Jesus does. So chapter 8, verse 2, he focuses attention on a leper. One. (laughs) One leper. Verse 5, when he entered Capernaum, a centurion. So we've got an outcast like a leper, a taboo of society, And now we've got a Roman centurion. And we don't like centurions. We don't like Roman occupation. Verse 14, and when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. So the apostle Peter's mother-in-law, he deals with her. So we've got a leper, we've got a centurion, we've got a mother-in-law. Jesus is really merciful, isn't he? A mother-in-law. Verse 20. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Who did he say that to? Verse 19. A scribe. It's a very, uh, um, uh, very good vocation to be a scribe. It's looked up to. It's honored in that society. A scribe. A leper, a centurion, Peter's mother-in-law, a scribe. Look at verse 22 of the same chapter. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Leave the spiritually dead to bury their physical dead. You follow me. So he grabbed hold of a disciple that needed a little bit of help. Verse 28, and when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gerardians, two demon-possessed men met him. Now we've got two demon-possessed men. Chapter 9, verse 2, and behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed, a cripple. Verse 9 of chapter 9. It says, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. Just a guy, just a tax collector, skimming a little bit too much off the top, sticking his own pockets. Chapter 9, verse 18. 
While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. A ruler. A daughter. Chapter 9, verse 27 And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men, not two blind mice, but two blind men, followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. Just two blind men. They hear that Jesus is in town. Chapter 9, verse 32. As they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. Look at this. A leper, a centurion, Peter's mother-in-law, a scribe, a disciple, two demon-possessed men, a cripple, the calling of Matthew, a ruler's daughter, two blind men, a demon-possessed mute. What is Jesus doing? He's focusing on individuals. And his society that Jesus is preaching this sermon in is the kind of society that just a little bit more than three years from preaching this sermon, this is the kind of society that will spread rumors tell lies and slander Jesus with mob crowd violence and will publicly have him crucified. That's the society that Jesus lives in. And what's he doing? He's not focusing on culture. It's just as bad then as it is today. Just different. But he's going after people. Individuals. And when we think about that in our own lives, can't you also just look around? People you work with, people you know, they're all around us. Someone just found out he has cancer. A single mom is raising children on welfare. A single mom just had an abortion. Someone has just decided his life of self-indulgence is absolutely pointless and meaningless. And he doesn't know what to do. Someone near you. Someone near me. Someone is being convicted of their sinful habit and, and, and can't understand what to do. There is a marriage falling apart. There is a college student feeling lost in a sea of debt and cynicism because no one will hire him, <laughs> even though he's got a four-year degree. There is a teen somewhere who's contemplating suicide. There is a teen whose best friend just committed suicide. There is a man who can't seem to find his way in life. Someone near you is afraid. Someone near you is lonely. Someone near you is sick. Someone near you is stuck on a merry-go-round of despair. And it's got nothing to do with culture per se. Focus on individuals. It's all around us. All around us. Yes, and Planned Parenthood is doing what it's doing, but yet there's individuals all around me. Individuals. You know what they were doing to babies in Jesus' day? That's exactly right. They were just chopping them in half. Or they'd go lay them on the city dump. A woman would deliver. She'd walk her baby, walk over to the city dump, and just throw it there. The Christians would come by because they, they would have their eyes on it. And rescue. You know, at any given moment in the uh, increasing secularization, secularization, that is a hard one, of our culture, you know, God is still at work in, in, in a thousand different ways. He's still at work in a thousand different ways. And it doesn't matter how bad it gets. God is still at work in a thousand different ways all around us, individuals, individuals. So we need to work hard on not thinking of looking at people as specimens of this wretched culture that we're living in. Think of individuals, people that God is leading you to be salt and light. That's how you think about people. God saves individuals, right? Not culture. Jesus didn't come and die on the cross to save culture, but individuals. And that's never been rescinded. And it's still good. Focus on individuals. That will go a long way in fighting pessimism in a post-Christian society. Secondly, 
Respond to persecution with good works that points the way to a better place. Back at the Sermon on the Mount, at the beginning of it, Jesus said, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you, verse 11, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. 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 Do you believe in heaven? Later, Jesus would say, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Respond to persecution with good works. Now, the reason why I say that is because I believe what's happening here, when Jesus uses verse 11 and 12 to get us ready to be aware that if we're going to live out these beatitudes, as they are commonly called, these, these, these wise characteristic aspects of what it means to love Christ in the first set of the verses, first part of the sermon, then the persecution is going, consequently, is going to come. But since you are salt and you are light, therefore, verse 16, do good works. And it's those good works that the same people that are reviling you are going to see. See the connection? The good works here, specifically in context, is the way you respond to the persecution. The way you respond to the mockery the way you and I respond to being reviled and harassed because we follow Christ. That response is those good works that Jesus is referring to that function like salt and light. And look at the end result of it. So that they may see your good works at the bottom of verse 16 and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now it's a strange thing that Jesus would use good works here in the context of the Bible itself. Because the whole Bible says what about our works? There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who does good. (laughs) And on and on and on. And yet Jesus says that they may see your good works. How is that possible? Given the fact that I am not capable of producing good works, and the Bible is very clear about that, I cannot work my way to heaven. Remember how the sermon started? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Remember last week? Blessed are those who know themselves because it's a blessing. You've been gifted. You've been blessed to know yourself as spiritually bankrupt. You've got nothing. And when you follow this wisdom from heaven then it opens up the fact that when I do these good works, responding to hostility and being made fun of as a Christian, you believe the homosexuality is a sin? Yes, like all other sexual sins are a sin. And well, that, and here it comes, the backlash, the pushback. And the way you respond to that is a good work, says Jesus. How is that possible? It's because you're bankrupt, and now that good work is not of your own. It's a work of God. In you, which is why Jesus can say that they may see your good works. In other words, you live out your life for Christ, you get persecuted, you respond with a good work in the face of that persecution, they get saved, God gets the glory. That's the links, that's how it looks. God gets the glory. So, in other words, don't assume that a person's initial initial negative response to you as a Christian and for the truths that we believe in, don't assume that that initial negative pushback is where it's going to end. Now, I, I, I can say this right now because no one in here knows the person that I'm going to refer to in my mind, but I am witnessing to a neighbor right now and have been for quite some time. And you know what's happening? I'm getting closer and you know what he's doing? He is spewing out more and more cuss words. See, he used to hold his tongue. He used to respect me. But now the closer and closer salt and light is taking place, 
he is literally using such foul language right in my face that he never did before. And he knows I don't like it, but that's why he's doing it. To the salt and the light is getting too close. So what should I do? Smack him, shut your mouth. You know, don't cuss in front of me. Yeah, it's just, it's just, you know, what am I supposed to do? Well, I'm to do, uh, in, that, in the response, in the face of that, I am to love him, respect him. Maybe I might say something like, call him by name and say, just want to let you know that um, you've really ramped up your foul mouth in the past several months. Just want you to know that, and I think I know why. I might say that. I've actually been thinking about saying that to him as my next step. I don't know. I need wisdom. But it's that good work, it's that love, it's the kindness that I need to keep showing him in the face of his foul mouth aimed at me more and more, a little bit more. That is that good work. And look, notice is that there's a time gap in between, there's a space of time in between hostility being reviled, being harassed, being persecuted, and the seeing of that good work by which God uses that to penetrate their heart and break them down and move them to repentance so that they give glory to God because of the good work. There's a time, so, so don't, get, don't get too discouraged that just because you're witnessing to someone and you get the pushback, then you say, well, pfft, he's just a part of society, just part of this nasty culture that we live in. No, he, she is an individual. The pushback is going to be there. Wait and give God time that they may see your good works, singular or plural. Plural. You keep, stay nice, stay nice. <laughs> stay nice again and again and again that they may glorify God. Respond to persecution with good works that points the way to a better place. Now, why do I say that? Because great is your reward in heaven. Seek first the kingdom of God. And here's the reason why I say this. If you and I do not fight pessimism, we will communicate to individuals that there's no other place worth going to. Is that what you want? Do you want to communicate with your angst and your rah, rah, along with this culture that this is all there is to it? And if we don't get it back, if we don't get Mayberry back, then it's over with? No, it's not over with. It's called heaven. It's right there. See? Heaven. Great is your reward in heaven. There is another place to go to. This is not my home. Yes, it breaks our heart. But let us not inadvertently communicate to individuals around us through our pessimistic attitude and our angry and scowling faces that there's no other place to go to. There is. There is. Finally, Believe that Jesus can raise the spiritually dead in any place, at any time, under any circumstance. In your Bibles, when you get to the end of chapter 9, just, just look, at, look at this. As I remember, I, I, Jesus led us all the way through his own example of focusing on individuals, not culture. And then he switches gears, and now he's got his whole group of disciples. He's got Matthew on board now, and he's got his whole group of disciples. Now what is Jesus going to do? He has set the example of focusing on the individuals. He's got his full group of disciples. What does he do? Chapter 10, we're not going to read any verses, but chapter 10 is all about Jesus and his disciples, and he's going to instruct them. You know what I've been doing the past several days, past several weeks? I want you to do it. So he's getting them ready to now go out 
and focus on individuals. And he prepares them for that. And he even repeats things that he said in the Sermon on the Mount, especially the issue of, get ready, the pushback is going to come. You are going to invite harassment. It's going to, it's going to come. He reminds them of that. Then he sends them out. He reminds them of, don't fear. Uh, you're bringing peace, not a sword. Persecution's going to come. Go do it the way I did it. Rewards are coming. And then chapter 11, he says a few more things. And then, verse 20. Chapter 11, verse 20. Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. This is sort of a summary from the Sermon on the Mount, moving out, staying focused on individuals, not culture. God has band of disciples together, instructing them, now go do as I do. And he comes to this pivotal point and just simply says, he's, I'm going to denounce every place that I just did all these good works. He says, woe to you. In Hebrew, it's an idiom, it means May my father's damnation fall upon you. Because I did works in you, and it didn't move you one bit. So Jesus does this. Now there's an important thing why we're on this third point that I want to show you. Verse 21. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon. In other words, if, if, if the works that has been done here in Israel had been done in those Gentile faraway regions, they would have repented. But I did them right here in front of you and it didn't even move you. They would have repented. Verse 22, but I tell you it will be, and because of that, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon, far outreached Gentile cities, than for you, Israel, because of so much salt and so much light has been available to you. And you did not repent of your sins. You did not turn to me as Lord and Savior. That's what Jesus is doing here. And you, Capernaum, verse 23, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, back, back in Genesis, Sodom and Gomorrah, had the works that I'd done in front of you had been done there, they would have repented and that city would have survived. It wouldn't have fallen under the wrath of God. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. There is degrees of punishment in hell. Sodom is going to get off a little lighter than Israel. What does that say for this country? The amount of salt and light that this country has been afforded It will be more bearable for a subterranean African man with a bone through his nose that has never, ever once heard of the gospel, though creation is a witness against him. It will be more bearable for him than for my neighbors on the day of judgment. These individuals, it's incredible. And then what does Jesus do at that time? This is his first post-sermon prayer. He's done the works. He's got his disciples together. They're, they're just about ready to be launched out. And what does he do? He pauses and prays. And this is why I say, believe that Jesus can raise the spiritually dead individuals in any place, at any time, under any circumstance. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding. That's actually a term of derision. He's actually saying that Israel is so lost in her sins. They think they're wise. They have no idea how foolish they are. Again, the Proverbs motif. Here it comes. The wise king. You have hidden them from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. 
like a leper, like a centurion, like a scribe, like a two demon-possessed men, like a cripple, like the ruler's daughter, like two blind men, like a demon-possessed mute. To little children, yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. And here we see the sovereign grace of God. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. It's the Father's gracious will that the Father and the Son choose who gets to see, who gets to hear the truth, and who doesn't. And, verse 28, come to me. So God's sovereignty is not a contradiction of the call you need to follow Christ. You need to follow Christ. But see, look where my hope is in. As I'm being sent out, as you're being sent out, where is my hope? Is it in the sinner's ability to wake himself, to wake herself up to the truth? Is, it in, is my hope and my ability to, to, to out-argue a sinner? No, my, my hope is in the Lord. To do what? To do the very impossible. For we were once dead in trespasses and in sins, but he made us alive. That's what God does. And it's his sovereign will to do so. And it's not a contradiction to the offer to come. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden. There are people, individuals all around us. Though they may not look like it, they may give the appearance that they're tough and strong, but there are people all around us who are heavy laden and laboring under a yoke of sin and bondage, maybe even trying to religiously work their way to heaven through their good works, which they don't have any because they don't know themselves as poor in spirit. Yeah. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Um, you know, it's no harder for God to save people day, today than it was in the first century, right? Is, is, is it too hard for God now? I mean, look, look at society, look at culture around us. I mean, God can't, he just, you know, you've got to have a better, more pliable culture more moral. No, no, you don't. No. You see, evangelistic despair or cowardice in the face of a deeply secular culture is completely out of place in the church and in our hearts. And the reason why is because the power of the gospel has never, ever depended upon having a responsive, moral, Christian influence culture in order to reach individuals. It's never been that way. Never. The Spirit blows wherever He wills. So, fight, fight, fight against pessimism in a post-Christian influenced culture like this. And the Lord will bless. The Lord is not done with us. He's not done with you. He's not done with me. There is more to do. And great is your reward in Heavenly Father, thank you for these truths. Not only do I pray for, and we pray for ourselves, our own lives here, but Lord, we pray for the church all, all across the United States of America, that you would encourage her, equip her, sustain her to be courageous and yet loving and kind and gentle again and again and again. A plurality of good works uh, that individuals, uh, having received a salt and light effect response, uh, will turn to know the Lord. And Lord, all these things are sovereignly in your hand. So Lord, thank you for these words. Help us to take them to heart. Help us to be confident in them and apply them in our everyday walk of life. Thank you, Lord, for seeking us as individuals, 
calling us, choosing us, waking us up, literally raising us out of being dead in trespasses and in sins. Thank you, God, for doing that for us. To you belong all the glory. In your name we pray, amen.